So I just argued. Uh, I just argued here that when we only have these local interactions, then if the probability if we condition one random variable on all others is the same as conditioning one variable only to those that are directly connected to it in such a factor graph. Um, this is also called, so the, the set of neighbors is also called the Markov blanket. And the whole thing is a manifestation of a Markovian property, hence the name Markov random fields, right? because only the immediate neighbors matter. And this means that a probability of all random variables I can more generally uh, factorize as follows. Yeah? So, so Z now is, is, the, is all my random variables, Z1 to Zn. And now I'm writing here P for partition function is the product over all factors. Um, let's call this and each factor has only a few of the random variables in its scope. So those are, so a factor is a box and uh, the scope is the set of circles connected to that box yeah, in the factor graph model. And the whole thing needs to be normalized, so this is the partition function here. Why we call this partition? I don't understand this terminology. Um, it's just uh, by analogy from physics. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I could write it explicitly as uh, the sum over the probabilities of all other states. Um, and that is called partition function. Yeah. Okay, and uh, let me write formally. So the scope of a factor phi i is the set, the set of random variables cj which are connected in this factor graph so that uh, cj and phi i are in the edge set um, for a factor graph g which is uh, specified through a set of vertices and edges. Uh, so for us let's say um, the random variables and the factors and then the edges between them. Okay, and if this probability is strictly greater than zero for any configuration Z, then we can write or express the same thing through a Gibbs measure, um, through an energy. So P of Z is then e to the minus e of Z, again normalized with the partition function. And usually it's uh, easier for us to argue in terms of this energy, and this is what we've been doing so far already with our small tables. So if I take the log of P and use this formula here, then the product becomes a summation. So instead of a product, I get a summation and um, these potentials, I'm calling them psi i. Where psi i is just minus 
the log of the factor phi i. Okay, so we have uh, this. So you know, at a heart, this is what an undirected graphical model is about. Uh, this equation here, or what a Markov random field is about, namely that uh, the joint distribution of a big set of variables factorizes as uh, factorizes over. Um, functions that depend only on subsets of the variables. And the sparser the subset is, and uh, the less loopy the resulting graph, uh, the more tractable the model is from a computational point of view. So if you like, you know, by, by these items one and two, I said, what do we need to specify a Markov random field? I said, we need uh, the set of random variables. So some of the nodes in our graph. And then uh, this item number two, um, you can think of as the topology in our graph. And one and two together specify, as I said, uh, a family of random variables, not uh, not a family of distributions, not a single one. And if we now want to address a specific family member, we need to become more specific. Uh, we need to say what is the domain of our random variables. So, for example, in the OCT. I need to specify in the OCT example how many classes do I want to consider at all. So in the OCT example, we said that uh, each the latent variable associated with each pixel can either be, uh, if we look at the figure, there was one layer called the nerve fiber layer, or another layer was called the ganglion cell layer and, and so on. Or for short, I called them A, B, C. Uh, yeah. But we need to dis decide how many classes do we want to distinguish. Um, and the red variables, uh, they can be discrete, yeah, like different classes, um, or they can also be continuous. So if I wanted to model, you know, the mass or length of objects or so, uh, then maybe it's more natural or how, you know, how far away they are, that then may be more natural to model them in a continuous fashion. And then finally, we need the potential functions or the conditional probability tables. Okay, and with um, these four items together, I have completely specified the distribution that I'm talking about. And um, now that we have a distribution over images, we can start asking questions. Uh, for example, we can uh, try and uh, draw samples from the distribution or find the mode and so on. But you have a question? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, are there questions at this point? Yeah? Oh, sorry if you already said that. I understand now if we have these four that if I look at two different labelings, I can say which labeling is more probable than the other. But how, would, like, if we don't want to brute force all possibilities, how do we find the best label? Um, so, for Markov random fields in general, uh, it's an NPR problem. Um, so, you can do a little better than brute forcing um, by using uh, branch and bound techniques. Uh, but 
and, and we will see how to do that uh, next week. Uh, so how to formulate Markov random fields as integer linear programs. And um, this always works, provided you have a big enough computer, uh, which you won't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, uh, with this formulation, uh, you can solve uh, problems exactly, you know, maybe on 20 by 20 pixels, but not on a thousand by thousand. So depending on how frustrated your system is. Um, so people either resort to approximate techniques or to a uh, more approximate modeling. Um, I mentioned that there are um, specific type types of MRFs which do afford much cheaper inference. For example, if we only have two possible labels, not K labels, and if we only admit uh, uh, attractive interactions, um, then this is uh, then efficient algorithms exist. Yeah? Then you can solve this uh, by solving a max flow uh, or a min cut problem. Yeah? Um, but in general, it is an expensive thing. So the short answer is, you know, uh, please. Be patient. Wait until next week, and then the week after. Uh, next week we'll do. We'll say how to do this exactly, uh, and the week after how how to do it exactly in a in an interesting subclass of models. More questions. Okay, so. No, I, I earlier plotted the Gaussian distribution and said we can draw samples from this. Um, now we have a distribution over images and uh, we can ask questions. Uh, now we don't have a Gaussian distribution. We have, you know, in, in a very high dimensional space, a complex distribution. Um, so typical questions to ask are, you know, please give me samples from the distribution. And then from these samples, I can, uh, you know, estimate aggregate quantities, or uh, I can um, try and approximate my full distribution with something that's simpler, or I can try and find, especially when we talk about the posterior, if I, if I say this distribution here is uh, P of Z given X, then, then I can ask for that solution Z, which corresponds to the maximum of this distribution. And uh, that would be the maximum a posteriori solution. And that's what people hunt for most of the time. Yeah? Um, and next week, we will see how to, how to compute this exactly in principle. Um, this week, let's focus on the drawing of samples. And uh, this relates to this, uh, you know, piece of to this piece of software that I showed you earlier. Yeah, so uh, sampling from a distribution, uh, prior, posterior, just, just any distribution. Let's just say sampling from a distribution. Um, a popular method is Gibbs sampling, which is a special version of a Metropolis Hastings sampler, um, which in turn is an example of a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. So in Markov chain Monte Carlo, in general, the idea is um, that you have a system which is in some state, and then you have a matrix of transition probabilities to another state. Um, you select a transition randomly, and from there on, make another transition, and so on. And um, it's uh, the Markov in this word now, Markov chain, has nothing to do with the Markovian neighborhood that we discussed earlier, or not immediately. Rather, it has to do with um, that the next state only depends on the current state in time. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you want to sample a random walk, that would be an example of a of a Markov chain. And uh, here, we essentially want to uh, do a random walk in image space. And uh, if the transition probabilities for this random walk are chosen correctly, um, then we sample from 
a specific distribution, in our case, uh, from the Markov random field that we have specified. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you a pseudocode here. Yeah? Uh, you first initialize all of your random variables randomly. Or you can uh, do it by some other means. Uh, you can get a you know, best guess, uh, for example, um, randomly or better. Um, then you loop until infinity, um, where you uh, randomly, <coughs> either randomly or sequentially, um, you select an index, let's say S, randomly or sequentially. Um, randomly is uh, better in theory and sequentially is usually better in practice. Uh, what do I mean, mean by that? Um, there's a trade-off. If I want to uh, sample randomly, I, I really need to make a random access to my memory. Um, whereas if I do it sequentially, um, this usually works much better with the prefetching uh, of your cache uh, in, in your processor. Um, so uh, you get, if you, if you do it randomly, um, you get independent samples faster, but you get fewer samples per wall clock time, minute or hour. And this is why in practice, usually people do it sequentially. Um, but there's a whole science to it. And uh, for example, um, there is a paper scan order in Gibbs sampling uh, from this year, which you can uh, study if you like. Um, they look also at uh, notorious cases where the sequential sampling can be arbitrarily bad. Okay, now we've selected an index uh, and now comes um, the actual thing. Namely, we sample a new label for this index S conditional on the values that we currently have in the neighborhood, conditional on the labels in the neighborhood. So we sample ZS from the conditional distribution And the conditional distribution that, let's say, I'm writing capital ZS to say that the random variable at site S takes a particular label, let's say K, given that all other random variables, so Z except S, have some you know, current state. And now thanks to this spatial Markovian property, I only need to take into account the immediate neighbors when I want to compute this. Yeah. Um, so I use um, this formula here. Um, I compute the energy for my S a pixel being in state k and all others being in whatever state they previously were. And now I need to try this out for all labels. So if I have k possible labels, I now try this out for k possible labels and I use this to normalize. And uh, by the way, you know, this complicated notation here, I'm just using capital letters for the random variable 
and I'm using a small letter here for the realization. Um, this is a distinction that is made in statistics, but not usually made in, in computer vision. And I've made it here once just to be uh, very explicit. Okay, and now beautifully, um, the partition function cancels. And uh, also beautifully, I only need to take into account the immediate neighborhood when computing this and not all other pixels. So I'm not going to write the whole thing. Uh, it's just that uh, we need only need to condition on z the neighbor the neighbors of s, yeah, both in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, and then um, we. So for example, if I have four different classes, um, I get uh, four different numbers for how likely it is uh, conditionally to get a class A, B, C, or D in this pixel, conditioning on all others. And then um, I would sample according to these probabilities that I've just found. Um, so not necessarily take the biggest one, but just any. And then importantly, I need to update my uh, label image with this new sample. So I don't keep uh, one copy of my label image at time t minus one and a new copy, which I slowly uh, fill at time uh, t, but rather I always immediately update the single label image that I have. So the algorithm is already done, uh, just to avoid ambiguity here. Uh, we immediately overwrite old values with new values. Okay, and one can prove, and I'm not doing it here, but it is, uh, you know, in this red and yellow book by Winkler that I've uh, given you. Um, you can prove that uh, this generates samples according to the correct distribution, so the one specified by our undirected graphical model. after some burn-in period. So let's say we initialize here. Um, and then after some burn-in period, we get samples from the correct distribution. Now these samples have a particular property Namely, they're not independent, right? So I've between this between these two pictures lie uh, whatever a hundred or, or a thousand iterations, and these are correlated. So if you like, uh, in image space. You know, I'm starting at some trajectory, or, or I'm starting at this, you know, this let's say this random initialization, and then I usually make a pretty large jump in the first uh, few iterations, 
uh, and then I have this, you know, gradual, possibly self-intersecting this trajectory, which ultimately generates samples from the correct distribution. But they are all correlated. So if we want to get uncorrelated samples, we have to take only, uh, you know, every millionth or, or how many. Yeah. Okay, and um, now this is a extremely simple recipe. Uh, it is computationally expensive, but it's extremely simple and you can apply it to any Markov random field. So, for example, we can use this now. Uh, we can sample from the prior, as we've done here. Or we can also sample from, poster from the posterior, of course. And, well, if we sample from the posterior, we get many, many images. And then the question is, how do we summarize these images? Because usually when somebody gives you, you know, an input image and asks you for, let's say, a semantic segmentation for an answer of which is the correct label in each pixel, they don't want you to come back with 10 million answers, 10 million answer images. They would like you to come up with, you know, one or two images. So here, for example, um, what you can compute uh, if you now sample many images from this posterior is you could compute, for example, the mean or you could uh, compute, for example, the marginal spread. What I mean by that is you could, uh, for each single pixel, ask, uh, okay, if I now consider all these different realizations, these different images, um, on average, uh, how much do they disagree? Yeah, so in a, in a classification problem, I could, for example, compute the entropy in each pixel across the classes, across the many samples that I have. Yeah, so uh, let's say maybe in some pixels, uh, if it's class A, B, C, and D, uh, in some pixels, uh, practically all the samples predict class B, then we're probably pretty sure but maybe in a different pixel, uh, you know, we are not quite sure whether it's A or C. Yeah? And that's the sort of information which you can get, uh, which you can express in a marginal fashion, so in a, in a per pixel fashion. Okay, maybe now is a better time to ask questions for you. Yeah. Um, you, don't, uh, you said samples are correlated, but it means that Marco random field you assume uh, is only uh, correlated between its neighbors for the random variable. Uh, what's the inter interaction between? Okay. Um, so, you know, like I said, we we use the Markov the word Markov twice here in different contexts. One is in the spatial sense, and one is in the sense of this uh, Markov <laughs> chain. Um, now, by the way, um, in the Markov chain, uh, excuse me, in the Markov random field, the fact that we have conditional independence uh, does not mean that we have independence of the variables altogether. So, um, let me stress that uh, conditional independence is not the same thing as independence. For example, if I have here random variables, uh, Z1, Z2, and Z3, I can say that, or a, a statistician would write that um, C1 is independent of Z2, uh, excuse me, of Z3, given Z2. So this is, uh, in, in words, Z1 is conditionally independent of Z3 given Z2. Um, but, um, you know, we have these interactions which are mediated. So if Z1 has an interaction with Z2 and Z2 has an interaction with Z3, then as an as a end result, Z1 and Z3 will also be correlated. 
And this is what is interesting in these methods that I can get very long range correlations by specifying only short range interactions. This is exactly the power of this Markov random field modeling. Okay, so this is part one of the answer. And part two of the answer now is, um, you know, my picture here, this was in some abstract space of images. Yeah? And, uh, and, you know, the space is a million dimensional, so I cannot really plot it. But, um, Whenever we change a single pixel, you know, by definition, all these uh, images have a Hamming distance of one. Um, however, uh, qualitatively, you know, we would argue that here at the beginning, there's a big change yeah, in the very first few iterations. Um, and uh, then over time, the changes are more gradual. And uh, that is uh, not just a qualitative impression, this is also true, because in our algorithm, um, we are also allowed to keep the old label. Yeah? So in fact, um, when we compute this formula here, we do not take into account what was the previous label at that point. So we were, if we were previously uh, voting for uh, whatever the ganglion layer, then we can again vote for the ganglion layer by making one Gibbs uh, sampling step. And uh, um, so sometimes it is possible to uh, have a Hamming distance of zero, yeah, by you just, you know, you happen to select your old label again. Yeah? Um, and what I try to say is that um, if we, you know, if we make uh, here 100 steps at a time or something, the images that we get are fairly similar. Yeah, they are not completely independent samples from the same distribution, and uh, this is now correlation in a second sense, namely in this uh, temporal sense within the Markov chain. More questions, yeah. How do we decide when we can sample? Um, so how long the burn in period is? Do we have some ah, a priori estimation uh, or do we it's a good question. Um, so you can try and get bounds on the so called mixing time. Um, but I would say they are loose or they're uh, or computing tight bounds is as hard as solving the actual problem. So uh, uh, in short, I think the answer is uh, no. Uh, you 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 just you know uh, throw away the first million samples. Uh, you know you, you look at it and then <laughs> uh, discard the beginning. Of course, if you sample for a very long time, it doesn't matter because if if I compute something like the mean, eventually you know it will we have a sort of linear forgetting. Yeah, the longer we sample from the chain. Um, so you're saying, uh, let's look at the number of accepted moves or something, uh, or let's look at the hemming distance over a certain distance. Um, I think that is a useful measure, yes, to figure out when the burn-in period is finished. Um, it does not, however, um, guarantee that you have... Uh, um, so there are, there are certain rare events, yeah? like, um, uh, and, and it cannot, uh, so this sort of measure cannot tell you if you're stuck in a local uh, high probability island. Yeah? So it can so happen that you stick in one, uh, so I was somewhere plotting this, 
distribution. Where was that? OK, so it, it can be that the distribution, you know, that you're stuck sampling this hump here. And because there's a very low probability transition from one hump to the next, um, it can be that you're stuck in here for a long time before you eventually make the transition. And that kind of thing you cannot detect by what you just described. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? So, uh, you know, if we look at the research in computer vision, then 99.999% uh, of papers uh, try and find the mode of the distribution, and the rest is interested in the distribution as a whole. Um, so, for example, the whole distribution is being used in situations like uh, radiation therapy planning, yeah, where it really matters. Uh, so, it's the life of a patient is at stake, yeah, about having the proper uh, treatment plan. Um, so there people will go to the uh, expense of actually sampling from the full distribution and getting uncertainty estimates. Um, but there are also uh, different means of uh, in Bayesian approaches to uh, try and estimate more of the distribution. Uh, it's just that they are um, mathematically and in terms of implementation more complicated than this sampling. Yeah? So um, this is why we've been looking at this uh, sampling today. More questions? Okay, then just one more information. Um, so I've been saying that um, we have been uh, in this qualitative picture. Huh? We are somehow, uh, our Markov chain tries and sample from this distribution. Um, instead of um, here picking, instead of uh, <coughs> sampling uh, from the conditional distribution, uh, we can also uh, set our ZS to the argmax of the conditional distribution. So we don't sample randomly, but we take the, the label with the highest probability. And uh, this is a kind of uh, steepest gradient ascent uh, method. Uh, this is called ICM or iterated conditional modes. And this is a heuristic to lead you to the closest local maximum. Well, let's say if we were here initially, um, it will take you to this mode. You have no guarantee of getting to the global optimum this way. So it's a heuristic. Uh, mode finding strategy. And then you can try and make it better by uh, using many random initializations and then uh, try and see what is the highest probability solution that you find and so on. And then there are more extensions. Um, there are also block samples where you don't flip one random variable at a time, but many random variables at a time. These are actually um, so they have much faster mixing times. Uh, these are more efficient statistically. OK, um, so just brief outlook for the next two weeks. Um, next week, a strategy that will find us the mode guaranteed. However, uh, it can be arbitrarily expensive for bigger problems. That will be next week and the week after we discuss how to find the mode guaranteed, uh, but only on models with a special structure, notably uh, tree-shaped factor graphs. See you then.